Shalom Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, Shalom Aleichem. This is Comrade Net, cleric of public relations, Jewish Bundist diaspora movement. Please be sure to watch this program with a truly open mind, heart, and ear. This video will be setting the tone for upcoming videos on this channel. I would ask both Marxists and anarchists to just listen and know more follow-ups will be coming. This video covers what socialism is and what socialism is not. At this time, I am overwhelmed with many tasks. I have been politically drafted by Maoists and anarchists to build up defenses against the violent aggression of the fascist police in the state of Arizona. Trigger warning to all Marxist and anarchist comrades. This video will be giving a lot of credit to anarcho-syndicalists, Maoists, Magnoite, anarchists, and third worldists. Yet the critique of both Marxism and anarchism will be very heavy and brutal. Socialism is an economic system encompassing a range of economic characteristics manifested as collective social ownership for public benefit. This is done in opposition to many different exploitative systems such as colonialism and capitalism. Socialism has existed before the utopian and scientific communist theories of Marxism and anarchism. Although there is a lot, and I do mean a lot, of merit to dialectical materialism, this process of dialectics could evolve into something better. The systemic error in Marxian dialectics is Hegelianism. Hegelianism is the incorrect idealist position of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, a Eurocentric pro-colonialist. Eurocentric Marxists tend to sum up this incorrect idealist position with a short explanation, whitewashing the metaphysical ideals of Hegelianism as, quote, the rational alone is real. Close quote. Which allegedly means that all reality is capable of being expressed in rational categories. <laughs> Hegelianism is blind faith in absolute idealism. It was George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel who invented the metaphysical belief in nationalism. Nationalism is the metaphysical ideology which fuses nation with state. This should never be confused with patriotism. Patriotism is devotion to country. Ironically, most people confuse nationalism with patriotism. Before the idealism of George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel polluted and corrupted dialectics, dialectics had been a primary feature in Judaism known as peel pool. Marxists come in many different manifestations. For us Bundists, we tend to be better associated with third worldists, Maoists, and Marxist Leninists, although this was not always the case historically speaking. Before the old manifestations of Bundism, that is, we used to find ourselves more aligned with Trotskyists and anarchists. We also used to suffer with several reactionary social democratic views, as well as having both right and left opportunism. We have tried for a very, very long time to ally with the better Trotskyists, and we have failed miserably to do this. We have had many ups and downs with the anarchists throughout the history of the Bundist movement. Yet our, co our cooperation with the anarchists has not gone into decline. On the contrary, our camaraderie with both the anarcho-syndicalists and the Macnoite anarchists is increasing at a very rapid rate. We have much better relations with Marxist-Leninists but much of our co cooperation with them leaves a lot to be desired on their end. Yet, third worldists and Maoists completely outshine Marxist-Leninists. But to be fully honest, third worldists are far superior to all of their Marxist cousins, including the Maoists. To all of our Maoist comrades, just as you have demanded, Donna Newman has accepted the terms that she will not criticize me, Dr. Weisfeld, or herself. 
However, I support her in her upcoming criticism of Daniel, the newcomer that almost joined the Bundist movement. Along with this, I will be writing a full denunciation of him. As has been demanded, I will write out a self-criticism, a criticism of Dr. Weisfeld, and a criticism of Don and Newman. But be warned, I will be delivering a much heavier and overdue criticism of you. Marxism suffers with pragmatism at the expense of other revolutionaries. Marxists always push for doing what is correct, but then they reject the correct in favor of the practical. This is not a mere tendency in Marxism. It is a systemic problem that is interwoven within Marxist idealism. Anarchism has anti-Semitic origins. Clearly, our anarchist comrades reject anti-Semitism, just as our Marxist comrades reject the Jewish question by Karl Marx. However, our anarchist comrades tend to remain silent when other anarchists push anti-Semitic propaganda. Many of the anarchist principles are correct, however, anarchism is utopian. Utopianism is incorrect. Perhaps our anarchist comrades will take time to reconsider the many notions that they reject without investigation. Throughout history, there has been socialism. It has come and gone. What Karl Marx incorrectly referred to as primitive communism is actually tribal socialism. This is the oldest version of socialism. Historically, there has also been theocratic socialism, which is not as old as tribal socialism. What the Marxists and anarchists define as socialism is actually proletariat socialism. As Bundists, we adopt a lot of analysis of the world's hierarchical structures from anarchism. One of the most incorrect assumptions that most anarchists make is the fiction that patriarchy has ruled every pre-capitalist society. This is a very incorrect and Eurocentric point of view that anarchists need to correct if they wish to remain relevant. One of the most important concepts that the Bundist movement adopted from Maoism is the concept of primary contradiction versus secondary contradiction. We, however, reserve the right to improve parts of this theory that we find to be in error. This is a video by Jason Unruh that was released on June 25, 2013. This video will help to explain primary contradiction versus secondary contradiction. It can be quite difficult to understand dialectics given the nature of the topic and the difficult language that is used here. I will attempt to make understanding Mao Zedong's on contradiction easier for someone new to it to try to understand. The universality of contradiction is well known. This is the basis for all of dialectics. No one in dialectics disputes this. All things have contradiction in them. This universality has a twofold meaning. Contradiction exists in the process of the development of all things. In the process of development of each thing, a movement of opposites exists from beginning to end. The problem that arose here is that some denied the existence of contradiction at the beginning of each pro uh, process. The Soviet de Boren school claimed that contradiction did not appear at the beginning of a process. They claimed it appeared only when a process had reached a certain stage. This is essentially claiming that the cause of development before the contradiction appears would be external, not internal. This would be claiming that the contradiction is not universal. We know external influences are secondary to internal causes. The de Boren school is using metaphysical theories of external causality. If we accept this view as correct, we would see only differences, not contradiction. This is how it was put by Mao. The de Boren school sees only differences but not contradictions between the, the kulaks and the peasants in general under the existing conditions in the Soviet Union, thus entirely agreeing with Bukharin. They are incorrectly asserting presence or absence of contradiction. They should be seeing different kinds of contradiction. Contradiction is universal and absolute. It is in every process in the development of all things. The truth of contradiction within a process is as follows. The old process with its own contradictions creates the new process that has its own contradictions. At no time is there an absence of contradictions within a process. 
In each form of motion of matter, there is a contradiction which has its own particularity. Because there is only matter in the universe, that matter in motion must assume certain forms. When we look at each form of motion of matter, we take, we take note of the similarities it has with other forms of motion. What is essential is that we identify what particularities are different in each motion of matter, meaning we observe the qualitative difference between this form of motion and other forms. Every form of motion has its own particular contradiction. The particular contradiction is what makes one contradiction distinguishable from another. The differences in the motion of matter come from the differences in contradiction. The difference in the motion of matter can be seen in many different things. There are many forms of motion in nature, mechanical motion, sound, light, heat, electricity, disassociation, combination, and so on. All these forms are independent, but in its essence, each is different from the others. The particular essence of each form of motion is determined by its own contradiction. This is the same for every society and every particular form of ideology. They each have their own particular contradiction and particular essence. These particular contradictions make up and determine the basis of each science that investigates each motion of matter. In mathematics, there is positive and negative numbers. In chemistry, there is disassociation and combination. Classes and class struggle in social science. Dialectics is universal contradiction. It is in everything, everywhere. If we do not accept this, we can never understand how matter is in motion, thus preventing us from understanding the development of things. If we don't study the particularity of contradiction, we have no way of understanding the essence of a particular contradiction that which makes it different from other contradictions. We need this to learn the particular cause or particular basis for the movement or development of a thing. Without it, we wouldn't be differentiating between different fields of science. The same can be seen in the development of mankind's knowledge. First, he knows himself and knows particular things about his existence. With that basis, he can expand his knowledge to a general knowledge of things and subjects. This means a person has to learn the specific essence of many different general things before he can know the common essence of things. This is the basis for two processes of cognition, from the particular to the general, from the general to the particular. When the scientific method is followed properly, this cycle advances mankind's knowledge to a higher and higher stage. These two processes of cognition are connected. They make up the whole of the Marxist theory of knowledge. The main point Mao is making in this is how good and proper investigation is supposed to be carried out. Study each particular contradiction and the essence of it. Study the particular contradiction and the essence of each process in the long course of development of each form of motion and matter. In every form, the development, which is material, is qualitatively different. Each qualitatively different contradiction can only be resolved with a qualitatively different method. For example, contradiction between the working class and the capitalist class is solved by the method of socialist revolution. This recognition that it takes different methods to resolve different contradictions is when Marxism, Marxist Leninists must follow. Mao gave an example of this in his work. There exists the contradiction between all the oppressed classes in Chinese society and imperialism, the contradiction between the great masses of people and feudalism, the contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, the contradiction between the peasantry and the urban petty bourgeois on the one hand and the bourgeois on the other, the contradiction between the various reactionary ruling groups and so on. These contradictions cannot be treated in the same way since each has its own particularity. Moreover, the two aspects of each contradiction cannot be treated in the same way since each aspect has its own characteristics. Subjectivity must never be used in investigation. This also comes with the rejection of one-sidedness and superficiality. We must look at it objectively and not use the materialist viewpoint. The key is to look at particular problems from all sides. This would be looking at the individual parts and not the whole. It would be not looking at the characteristics of both aspects of a contradiction.
The fundamental contradiction in a process of a development of a thing and the corresponding essence determined by that contradiction will not disappear until that process is completed. However, in a lengthy process, the conditions differ at each stage. There is a reason for this. The fundamental contradiction in a process doesn't change. The fundamental contradiction will go through quantitative change become more intensified as it travels through one stage to the next in a lengthy process. This is not like the De Boren school, which thinks that the contradiction appears later. Mal says the contradiction goes through changes. Along with this, some of the major and minor contradictions, which are influenced or determined by the fundamental contradiction, will intensify. Some will temporarily or partially be resolved, and some new ones will emerge. This shows that the process is marked by stages. If this is not acknowledged, its contradictions cannot be dealt with properly. When studying the problem of a particularity, there are two points we must remember to look at for analysis, the principal contradiction and the principal aspect of a contradiction. In the process of the development of a complex thing, there are principal contradiction. This one contradiction has the ability to develop influence the existence of and or determine other contradictions in the process. As a brief example, we can show the, uh, the principal contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Uh, this influences the contradiction between different groups of bourgeoisie. One group of capitalists wants a freer bourgeois democracy to help smaller capitalists, while bourgeois fascists would rather have as little in the way of regulation that would help, that would help smaller capitalists compete. There is the principal contradiction of classes, and it influences the contradiction between the interests of different groups of capitalists. When American imperialists launched the war against uh, Iraq, Iraq and the imperialists became the principal contradiction. The various rival in contradiction groups temporarily unite as a force against the invaders. Sunni and Shiite um, militants, who normally fight each other, began to work together. The new primary contradiction of Iraq-U.S. imperialism influenced and altered the contradictions between the normally rival militant groups. Mao saw the necessity of this when he offered a temporary alliance with uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists against the Japanese imperialists. The Japanese aggression against China became the primary contradiction and altered the contradiction between the nationalists and the communists. Because there was also a contradiction between the U.S. and Japanese imperialism, it influenced slash altered the U.S. contradiction with communism, in which it gave weapons to the communist forces to fight the Japanese. Once the Japanese were defeated, the principal contradiction became the nationalists against the communists once again. This, was all, this also led to the U.S. contradiction with communism reverting back to where it was, but not in the same way now that the U.S. had armed them. When dealing with a complex process, we must identify the primary contradiction, then identify the secondary or subordinate contradictions that will be influenced by the primary one. This is a method used by Marx in studying the capitalist society. This is the same method used by Lenin and Stalin in studying imperialism and the general crisis of capitalism when they studied the Soviet economy. When we look at the principal contradiction, we should not see both aspects as equal. One aspect will be seen as primary and the other as secondary. At times it may appear as though they are in equilibrium, but it will only be temporary or be an illusion. The principal aspect will play a leading role in the contradiction once it has gained the dominant position. For us, this would be the capitalist class who owns the social power and the repressive mechanisms. This situation is not static. The two aspects influence each other and may change the nature of things. There will be a switch of positions where the principal aspect becomes the non-principal aspect. This occurs due to the increase and decrease in the force exerted by an aspect. This also applies to the new superseding the old. It is a general and eternal law that one thing transforms into another. This transformation takes place due to its essence and external contradictions. In this process, there is a contradiction between its new and its old aspects. This leads to a series of struggles. These struggles take the new aspects from being minor to major. The reverse is true of the old aspects. The new aspects take over, change the thing qualitatively into a new thing. It can thus be seen that the nature of a thing is mainly determined by the principal aspect of the contradiction, the aspect which has gained predominance when the principal aspect which has gained 
predominance changes. The nature of a thing changes accordingly. After you understand the universality and particularity of a contradiction, you must move on to understanding the identity and struggle of the aspects of a contradiction. Here's two points. In the process of the development of a contradiction, there is two aspects to it. They presuppose each other's existence, and both exist in a single entity. In given conditions, each of the two contradictory aspects transforms itself into its opposite. This is the meaning of identity. Lenin said, Dialectics is the teaching which shows how opposites can be and how they happen to be, how they become identical, under what conditions they are identical, transforming themselves into one another, why the human mind should take these opposites not as dead, rigid, but as living, conditional, mobile, transforming themselves into one another. There are contradictory aspects in every process. They exclude each other, struggle with each other, and are in opposition to each other. This happens in the process of development of all things, including human thought. A small process may contain only a single pair of opposites. A complex process may have any number of them. In addition, pairs of opposites are in contradiction with each other. This is how all things in the objective world and human thought are made up. This is also how they are set in motion. From this, we might get the idea that there is no unity and no identity. This is not true and, and is explainable. None of these contradictory aspects exists in isolation. They need each other in order to exist. Can any contradictory aspect exist independently of its opposite? Cold could not exist without hot. Without life, there could be no death. There is no above without below. Without tenants, there are no landlords. Without a bourgeois, there is no proletariat. This is how, on one hand, they are opposites and in contradiction, while on the other hand, they are interconnected and interdependent. This character is what gives them their identity. They only have an identity as they are connected. In given conditions, all contradictory aspects possess the character of non-identity and hence are described as being in contradiction, but they also possess the character of identity and hence are interconnected. This is what Lenin means when he says that dialectics studies how opposites can be identical. How can they be identical? Because each is the condition for the other's existence. This does not end with merely acknowledging that their contradictory aspects are necessary for each other's existence. What we also need to include is their transformation into each other. In given conditions, each of the contradictory aspects within a thing transforms itself into its opposite changes its position to that of its opposite. The transforming into its opposite is what revolution is all about. The process of revolution takes the contradiction of the proletariat and the bourgeois and makes that change. The proletariat goes from the ruled, from the, from the ruled to the ruler, the bourgeoisie from the ruler to being ruled. They take the position that was occupied by its opposite. If there was no identity of opposites, how could such a change even take place? This is the full meaning of the identity of opposites. All contradictory things are interconnected. They coexist in a single entity in given conditions. Under other conditions, they transform themselves into each other. This is what Lenin meant when he said how they happen to be and how they become identical under what conditions they are identical, transforming themselves into one another. If this is identity, then what is struggle? What is the relation between identity and struggle? All processes have a beginning and an end. All processes transform themselves into their opposites. The constancy of all processes is relative, but the mutability manifested in the transformation of one process into another is absolute. The two contradictory elements in a thing have two states of motion. First, a state of relative rest, and second, that of obvious change. The first is quantitative change and can appear outwardly at as being at rest. The second is the qualitative change that is very visible when the first reaches a boiling point. The unity of the first state of motion, the state of relative rest, can appear in different ways. Harmony, balance, equilibrium, or attraction. All these appearances are really just a state of quantitative change, not readily apparent to our eyes. This is the process of change from the first state to the second. The second the struggle of opposites goes on in both states, but the contradiction is resolved in the second. That is why we say that 
the unity of opposites is conditional, temporary, and relative, while the struggle of mutually exclusive opposites is absolute. The two opposite things can coexist in a single entity and can transform themselves into each other because there is an identity between them. Two contradictory things can be united and transformed under certain conditions. Under different conditions, they cannot be united and transformed. This is what is meant by condition, condition, conditionality. The difference, the, the identity of opposites in existence is conditional and relative. The struggle between the opposites exists from beginning to end of a process. Because of this, we say struggle is unconditional and absolute. The movement of opposites of all things is as follows. Conditional, relative, identity, and unconditional, absolute struggle. In identity, there is struggle. In particularity, there is universality. And in individually, there is generality. To quote Lenin, there is an absolute in the relative. When we are looking at the question of contradiction, we also look at the question of what is antagonism. In the history of human social struggle, antagonism is a manifestation of the struggle of opposites. This would be the contradiction between the exploiting and the exploited classes. They both coexist until it becomes an open antagonism that develops into revolution. This is why there is peace between classes and then there is war. It is also quantitative change becoming qualitative change. Here is an example by Mao. Before it explodes, a bomb is a single entity in which opposites coexist in given conditions. The explosion takes place only when a new condition, ignition, is present. An analogous situation arises in all those natural phenomena which finally assume the form of open conflict to resolve old contradictions and produce new things. We need to grasp this fact firmly if we are to understand why class war happens. Contradiction exists between classes, develops into antagonism, which eventually develops into class war. The different sides are not just in contradiction, they are antagonistic. The capitalist class thinks that the working class and the capitalist class need each other in order to survive and function. It maintains that this is the only world outlook there is. In doing so, it makes two mistakes. It doesn't see contradiction. It doesn't believe the two classes have separate interests. It doesn't see how the contradiction leads to antagonism. If their theory was true, revolutions would never have happened. We do, however, have to keep in mind that we must do a concrete study of all the circumstances of each struggle of opposites. Contradiction and struggle are universal, but the method of resolving them is not. Some have open antagonisms while others do not. Some have the antagonisms developed after a certain amount of time or changes in conditions. Lenin said, Antagonism and contradiction are not at all one and the same. Under socialism, the first will disappear, the second will remain. To finish, Mao says, that is to say, antagonism is one form, but not the only form of struggle of opposites. The formula of antagonism cannot be arbitrarily applied everywhere. Socialism is an economic system encompassing a range of economic characteristics manifested as collective social ownership for public benefit. Socialism is not higher wages. Socialism is not extreme taxation. Socialism is the system of putting into practice of a social economy for public benefit. Socialism has two primary features. One feature is economic equilibrium, which means housing, health care, the assurance of both personal and public property. The other feature is the bureaucratic empowerment of those working to keep their surplus value for themselves instead of having it taken from them as is done in capitalism. Capitalism on the other hand is based on the exploitation of those working. This means parasitically extracting the surplus value away from those working. Private property is not your house, your toothbrush, your car, nor is it your produce that you purchased. That is all personal property. This means that both the anarchist notion of collective cooperative society and the Marxist notion of the dictatorship of the proletariat both equate to socialism. China is a country that we Buddhists have a lot of sympathy for. China is a very progressive country and we denounce the Trump-backed Hong Kong protesters that wish to reinstate the British colony of Hong Kong's separation. 
However, China is not socialist. It is a capitalist country. China is also socially imperialist, just as Russia is semi-imperialist. This means that if we were to remove America from this equation, then China would be a primary contradiction and Russia only a secondary contradiction. However, both China and Russia equate to secondary contradictions. We must never neglect that secondary contradictions are still contradictions. This means supporting Russia in their propaganda war because they fund the underdogs of the world. It also means opposing Russia when they do colonialist actions such as drilling for oil on indigenous land. This means supporting China against the Trump-backed fascists demanding Hong Kong separation. It also means opposing China's exploitation of Africa. The next video will get into national cultural autonomy and many subjects that will make several Marxists and anarchists uncomfortable. Just understand that dialectics requires debate and so does reciprocity. This video will now close with Jason the Mouse Revel. This video was published on the date of December 3rd, 2019. The lie that China's socialists must finally come to an end. There are too many lies claiming that the party's capitalist Republic of China is a socialist power. This is simply not true. China is a capitalist power which is now reaching out with imperialist tentacles. Those wedded to the idea that China is socialist do so at the cost of third world independence and development. They do not want to see the truth, because the truth would be too painful to see. The global socialist situation is weaker than it has ever been. Almost all socialist countries today are social democratic. This is what socialists are doing. We're so desperate to have something to champion that we've abandoned supporting socialist movements in favor of supporting non-socialist ones. This is a problem that must be addressed and corrected. This video addresses th four primary issues, which by no means are all the legitimate ones that can be made, but I think they are the four primary points that can be made. Private property, state-owned enterprises, foreign policy, and solidarity with the DPRK. As we can clearly see, private property exists in China. Many of the pro-China crowd like to pretend that it is not the case. Regardless of their denial, the Chinese constitution not only acknowledges it, but the ownership of it is a right. The 13th article of the constitution makes this very clear. The legitimate private property of citizens shall not be infringed. The state protects citizens' private property rights and inheritance rights in accordance with the law in order to meet the needs of public interest. The state may levy or expropriate the private property of citizens in accordance with the law and provide compensation. No doubt the first thing the pro-China crowd would point out is that this part talks about the ability to levy or expropriate private property. With this provision, they'll no doubt claim that somehow this invalidates the existence of private property. Such an idea is false. It is very clearly stated that it's a right protected by law. For comparison, we can also look at the U.S. Constitution, which has a similar provision which allows for the confiscation of property. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure shall not be violated, and no warrant shall be issued upon probable cause supported by an oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. The Fourth Amendment clearly lays out the right of the state to confiscate private property with due process of the law. This seems to be no different with regards to China. If we were to take the pro-China crowd superficially, we could reasonably make the assumption that the United States is also a socialist country. It is wholly obvious that the existence of private property is offensive to the socialist mind. Marx outlined very well the problem with it. A capitalist subordinates the worker via wage labor to toil for him. 
The worker submits to this because he does not have any means of production of his own. This wage labor is the mechanism by which the capitalist controls him economically. This means that the labor of the worker is applied in the production of commodities for the capitalist to sell as property not as a direct satisfaction of human need. This disconnection between the application of labor and the direct satisfaction of need is called the alienation of labor. The labor of the Chinese worker is alienated without a doubt. The enshrined right of private property certifies that this takes place. Under no circumstances are we to be under the illusion that somehow this is invalidated by legalisms that place all land under ownership of the state. Exceptions are made for farming collectives. China openly acknowledges that the country is dominated by privately owned industry. In the South China Morning Post, it openly states, Private firms contribute 60% of the country's gross domestic product and account for 80% of all jobs in urban areas. This is a very clear functioning of private property and remains unhindered and well within the definition of private property. When it comes to the Chinese economy, we have to remind people of one important point. Socialism is not when the government does things. This is a point we have to make repeatedly, pounding into the head of both rightists and the pro-China crowd. Always, the argument is made is that China is socialist because there are state-owned enterprises. This does not equal socialism. This is the kind of argument that confused rightists and anarcho-capitalists and libertarians make. This is simply false. We should never make this argument for socialism. What the pro-China crowd does is use circular reasoning when it comes to Chinese state ownership. It's socialist because the state owns it, and we know the state is socialist because it owns the enterprise. There is a slew of questions not asked here by the pro-China crowd. Does it operate in a capitalist or socialist economy? This is the paramount question. State ownership is common in capitalism as well. Rather than actually demonstrate that China is socialist, its defenders instead presuppose China to be socialist. Therefore, the ownership of the state enterprise is also socialist. This is a logical fallacy. We can point to several aspects of state-owned enterprises that clearly demonstrate their capitalist nature. The Chinese government allows them to function in according to the market. This is the antithesis of socialism, which rejects the market as a mechanism of a rational allocation of resources, producer of inequality, and the source of alienation. Marx specifically points to the laws of supply and demand, which are influenced by the purchase and sale of private property. China openly says that they allow market forces and do not even provide a preferential treatment to state-owned enterprises. Long Waqing, the vice president of the Development Research Center for the State Council, said, It's all about fair competition, developing the market together. The statement was made in the South China Morning Post. He also said, Supporting SOEs did not mean the government would attach less value to private firms or foreign businesses. Here he is specifically saying that the state enterprises operate on a market basis and are equal to private companies which also should not exist. It is not just Long who says this. Chinese Premier Premier Li Qiang also acknowledges the capitalist nature of the SOEs. But since China began its reforms, we've emphasized that the state companies are market-driven. They don't represent the government. There is no ambiguity in his words. The SOEs operate on a market basis, the opposite of what socialism calls for. One cannot claim this is simply Western propaganda. This comes directly from a party-owned news outlet. In this same news report, it was announced that the government intended making business easier for private companies. It says, During his tour on Thursday and Friday, Lee pledged to reduce taxes and cut the cost of corporate financing, especially for small private businesses. Additionally, it says an advisory committee to the People's Bank of China said last week that the central bank would improve financing and credit structures to strive to provide financial support to private firms that matches their contribution to economic and social development. Another important question to ask here is why foreign companies are being allowed to compete with SOEs. Why would you even have a foreign company appropriating capital from a socialist society? 
This is not comparable to the special economic zone. This is direct foreign control over an enterprise. Socialist economics is opposed to competition, let alone allowing foreign capital to accumulate it. Even siphon it out of the country. If this is how capitalist SOEs are, imagine how capitalist and private businesses are. If we can plainly see that SOEs are not being run in a socialist way, they function as capitalist enterprises and allegedly receive no special treatment from the state. The government even goes so far as to claim that they're somehow not even affiliated with the state. This can possibly be described as state capitalism. One of Marx's arguments against capitalism was that production was for the market instead of direct human need. Market forces not people control things. This disconnection between people is what creates alienation. China openly acknowledges that the market is the mechanism here, not socialist cooperation or planning. The idea that China SOEs bear any resemblance to socialism is completely false. If China is supposed to be socialist, their foreign policy leaves much to be desired. I think the foremost question to ask in this area is, why does China give such imperialist loans to third world countries? Here's a prime example. Money was loaned to Kenya to build a port. However, the Kenyan government risks losing the lucrative Mombasa port to China should the country fail to repay the huge loans advanced by Chinese lenders. If China is involved in socialist cooperation, then why do they leave themselves the option of confiscating the port after loading up the debtor country. Reports also note that Kenya, along with others, face the risk of being offered liquidity relief at higher resource concessions that could only diminish the value of future export earnings. Pro-China people will no doubt claim that this would never happen. Two problems with this claim. Firstly, if it wouldn't happen, then why is it a condition of the loan? Secondly, it has already happened with another country. In December 2017, Sri Lanka lost its Hamban Tota airport to China for a lease period of 99 years after they failed to pay billions in loans. Now China has control of an important commercial and military waterway. This can potentially happen to the Zambian National Power Company. This kind of predatory behavior is part and parcel of how the International Monetary Fund carries out imperialist interests. They load up a country with debt, and then the, in the process steal their resources as compensation for the default. What proceeds to happen afterward is the wholesale privatization of state assets to foreign countries, particularly the imperialist ones. China is blatantly engaging in the same behavior with similar results. This fact is wholly denied by the pro-China crowd at the expense of the third world, its sovereignty and right to self-determination. Increasingly, the same pro-China people also quote significant African revolutionary Thomas Sankara, who said, Those who come with wheat, millet, corn, or milk, they are not helping us. Those who really want to help us and give us plows, tractors, fertilizers, insecticide, watering cans, drills, and dams. That is how we would define food aid. They completely contradict themselves here. They see no problem with exploitative loans of the IMF-style land theft of resources, which they acknowledge happens when China does it. Here's another interesting question. Why does China oppose revolutions taking place? If the CPC is supposedly a revolutionary organization, then why do they ignore the Naxal movement in China? While there's no much to be criticized of the Naxals, there is much more to be criticized of China for ignoring them. Why is China not helping struggling revolutions across the world? All of them need help now more than ever. At best, they provide loans to Venezuela, but ignore actual revolutions engaged in fighting. If they're a revolutionary party, why are they so afraid to give tangible support to actual revolutions? Because China is playing a political game of self-benefit, not spreading revolution. While the Naxos are left to use colonial-era weapons to fight off an increasingly fascist Indian government, China invests in building drones for Saudi Arabia. As U.S. politicians are finally acknowledging the Saudi genocide of Yemen, they're beginning to put some controls on what military hardware makes its way to the kingdom. Meanwhile, China has decided to enter the global military drone market and begin shipping the Chinese-made Wing Long 2. 
This is promoted by the South China Morning Post, so no claiming the information here is false by pointing to Western media. China claims that they only sell the drones for counterterrorism purposes. Since when was Saudi Arabia a counterterrorist state? They're the second largest promoter of terrorism next to the United States. What China is doing here is wholly opportunistic. They're in the drone game to make money and possibly corner the global market on them if they can. This is not in any way, shape, or form simply sales to counter terrorism. No one can possibly claim that the Saudis are opposed to terrorism. China is out to make a buck off of Saudi imperialist actions in Yemen. The pro-China crowd are dead silent on this issue. Another stark element of Chinese foreign policy is their position towards the DPRK. They've claimed that they're standing in socialist solidarity, yet their relationship is quite different. China has had, a, has had the DPRK over a barrel. They have to trade with them or the DPRK essentially has no one. It is practiced in Chinese foreign policy that they follow UN sanctions against the country, ones often placed without just cause. Sure, there are several Chinese companies which routinely violate the sanctions, but the Chinese government does enforce it. To make matters worse, China has even voted in favor of sanctions being placed. The question is why? If they acknowledge that the DPRK is under significant imperialist pressure, why wouldn't they support them against it? Why does China openly oppose the DPRK's nuclear program? The DPRK has every right to possess a means to defend themselves from imperialist aggression, a right which China has even acknowledged. Yet they oppose the nuclear programs. Why? Because China just wants to do business with everyone and make everyone happy. They don't want to take a principled socialist position on the matter. We're well aware of the excuse that the pro-China crowd makes. They point to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and China's obligation to follow it as a signatory. If the treaty is a hindrance to the survival and rights of a socialist country, then why does China abide by it? What's more important, adhering to a treaty that keeps the right of a socialist country not to have arms or solidarity with a socialist state? China has made its own intentions known. They side with the imperialist countries. Well, why do people think China is socialist, despite all the evidence? The pressing question is upon us. Why do they want to believe China is socialist, despite all the proof to the contrary? Why do they simply redefine socialism in order to make it fit what they want? There's probably a good number of reasons why they do it, which probably alter from person to person. However, I think there was one primary reason among the, the community. Firstly, there is a denial of how bad the revolutionary situation in the world is right now. Most Marxists and so-called Marxists essentially live in an echo chamber which they project their own revolutionary desires upon each other. This ends up creating an environment where reality is distorted by opinion and desire. The reality is starkly opposite. The revolutionary potential around the world is extremely low. The European First World is largely falling to a fascist path. The Western world is falling to a battle of social democracy against absolute insanity. The third worldist theory is that first world people will choose social democracy over revolution. This has been proven by historical examples and shows us that the more backward societies were the ones to advance revolution. Lenin has even recognized the reactionary social democratic trend. It was essentially him that saved the communist movement from the Second International. People like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, Andrew Yang, Oca Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are wholly dedicated to putting a human face on capitalism, not revolution. Let's face it, even if these Marxists want a revolution, the people of America don't. The average American won't fight for anything. They're not willing to fight and die in a revolutionary war. They're far more likely to fight a race war sometime in the future. The majority of Americans still believe in bourgeois democracy. Those that don't have gone completely apathetic. Even when they recognize the system is a fraud, they try to isolate themselves from it. They do because they can. The situation in the third world isn't much better. The Naxal movement and the New People's Army in the Philippines are slowly dying off. The Naxals have been devastated by the economic development in India in the past decade. The NPA simply refused to update their political line. The Communist Party of the Philippines still insists that the majority of the country is made up of peasants. 
But this isn't true. Just about half the population is made up of urban slum dwellers. Their numbers are shrinking by the year. When most Marxists need is a desire to be on the winning team, this is not what we've been for some time. It's the loss of the Soviet Union and the loss of China as bastions of socialism. The situation has been terrible. It is awful to be on the losing team. It's awful feeling when you acknowledge the objective situation facing the potential for revolution across the world. People need to believe things are not as bad as they are. They're willing to break theory in order to make it so to say what they wanted to say. They want to force theory to fit what they want, not use theory as a guide. We see this in some reactionary trends or redefining socialism is when the government does what's right for the people. This is, a, this is a common line used to justify China. There are two main problems with this line. Firstly, it deliberately removes class struggle from socialism. The basis of socialism is class struggle. It is not a short revision, it's, not, it's nothing short of revisionism to remove this element from the definition. This relegates some socialism to being whatever the government does. This new trend among leftists coincides with the same reactionary view the right has. Second, how do you define what's right for the people? Is it when the government provides a higher minimum wage? When it provides universal health care and education? When it builds roads and other infrastructure? When it reduces poverty? By this logic, social democracy is socialism. With all kinds of unscientific nonsense, you can, you, you can define anything as socialism. Unfortunately, it does. Nas Bowles, Baathism are socialism according to this definition. With this definition, Sanders and AOC are socialists, which they are most certainly not. The advocates of reactionary nonsense also promote FDR and Abraham Lincoln as socialists. Imagine the man who defeated slavery ushering in modern capitalism as a socialist because he defeated the last of the slaveholding society. Let us not forget that one time he acknowledged labor of a source of value. FDR was supposedly a socialist because he offered a good deal of concessions to the working class to prevent socialism from gaining too much influence. This is what happened in Western Europe to combat socialism. Socialism has been redefined to the very thing that is used to fight socialism. I suppose concentration camps of Japanese citizens of socialism now utter insanity. Mao already warned of such thinking. He didn't specifically speak about the kind of fake socialism, but he did warn of, much, of such unscientific ways of thinking. He called it cutting the feet to fit the shoes. The phony socialism and the definition thereof we face is a perversion of theory to fit a reactionary reality. These so-called socialists see what they want to see. It hurts their sense of hope for a revolution to acknowledge how bad things really are. So they create all kind of mental gymnastics to make China out to be socialist to protect themselves. Such anti-scientific, anti-revolutionary thinking should not be allowed to spread. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.